Alex Katahakis podcast, the show where I sit down and speak with inspirational, thought-provoking authors, therapists, and sex experts to discover ways to help you live a happy, healthy life. In today's episode, I talk to psychologist Dr. Rachel Allen. She blends Western medicine with Eastern philosophy and connects the mind with the body. Dr. Allen assists individuals and couples who are dealing with relationships, intimacy, and sexual health. Author of the new book, The Pleasure is All Yours, we have a lively discussion about what she calls body fullness practice. Her ultimate message is that connection to life's pleasures remains right there inside of you. I hope you get great pleasure from listening to this episode. So where do you get the idea to write The Pleasure is All Yours? I uh, came from, I guess, my whole life experience combined with uh, just some of the problems I saw with the clients I was working with, Um, you know, being as a psychologist who works at the intersection between mind, body, connection and somatic psychology, and then also uh, relationship and sexual health. I really noticed just how common it was that even though everybody has a body and everybody came from a sexual being, everybody seemed to really have a story of shame, disconnection, uh, confusion, guilt around their body and or their sexual selves and sexual identity. And uh, I was fortunate enough to grow up in a sex positive household where I um, I really wanted others, I guess, feel some of that absence of, of shame as well. So would you say that was well, also what inspired you to write the book or was there another source of inspiration? Because writing a book is no easy feat. Oh. Uh, it takes a lot <laughs> out of the person writing it. And it's a big sacrifice of time and energy and personal mm-hmm. life and all of that. Yes. And you, I know you've written many books, so you, you understand that it, it's funny. Cause my editor said, you know, just enjoy this. It's your first book for the next yeah. one. And I just said, wait a minute. Um, but yeah, that's a good point. And um, I think that I come from a lineage of writers and mm-hmm. of the women in my life and different forms of writing. And so part of me wonders if there's also just some sort of ancestral mm-hmm. um, influence and, and maybe given what we know about uh, intergenerational ancestral trauma, maybe it's been a source of healing, uh, therapeutic for, for this lineage of women in my life uh, to write because uh, it, it has been therapeutic for me. It's also been confronting me with my shadow. <laughs> oh, yeah, right, right. <laughs> I mean, especially when you write about sex. Yeah. So writing about sex means you're writing about it more than you're having it. <laughs> um, and then you've got to sort of test your hypothesis. Like, is this really true? Does this actually really work this way? So- yeah, yeah. And I, I definitely was feeling, um, I couldn't have felt less in my body some of those days when yeah. I was writing all morning in front of a computer. And then I was doing a lot of writing during the pandemic. So then I would be uh, in front of a screen for the rest of the day for clients. So sure. it was, it, it seemed like I was a bit hypocritical there for a while. <laughs> well, but I think that does speak to, Um, the reality of life not being either or that Mm -hmm. there are times when you know you are just a head looking in a screen and you're writing out what's coming to you in a very creative way but it doesn't mean you're in your body working out every day or moving around you're sitting and cramping up your neck and hands and um, you know so I always rail against this idea of you know that balance that we achieve some perfect balance we don't you know, there are good days, bad days, and sometimes we're doing things that are contorting our bodies, and sometimes we're doing things that feel fantastic. Yes, right, yeah. And I, in the in the book, I'm sure we'll get more into this, but it talks about bodyfulness. And one of the things that I say is, even though it's really about uniting, um, you know, our bodies and our right to receive pleasure, it doesn't mean that we feel good in our bodies every day or feel mm-hmm. pleasure in our body every day all the time. That that isn't what uh, this this book is trying to get people to do. That's just not how life is in Mm -hmm. our modern world or for humans ever. Well, speaking of that, when did you think the disconnection uh, between our, or from our body began in the U.S.? And why do you think it's prevailed for so long? I really, uh, maybe also in part being from the Midwest and from the U.S., Mm -hmm. um, because I know there's different, so many different differences from culture to culture, but um, I, I think with the puritanical history and, and religion and 
I was so surprised when I learned that the United States is, yes, one of the most repressed countries in the world. Um, but I think of how when you start with this culture that um, pleasure and indulgence and sex is, you know, it's not only lavish, but it's certainly not going to get you to heaven. And, um, and then moving forward from there, the ways in which we think of the industrial revolution and how these messages of, you know, I think therefore I am and produce more, do more, be more in your worth really lying in um, your productivity. Um, then who, you know, who would have time for pleasure? That was very threatening to be uh, listening to your desires and wants and having balance would set you off course from, you know, really productivity. Um, so I think that it's perpetuated. And, and now we have um, these ways of, putting this lens on the body, but not in a way that's really kind of from the inside out, you know, it's much yeah. more about the performative value. So uh, it's right. more skewed. And, how, <clears throat> and how it looks. Um, you know, my understanding of Puritanism is the idea was that we had these prefrontal cortices, which they didn't talk about in that way, but we had these brains um, that could um, prevent us from acting like quote animals. Mm -hmm. And so everyone was over-regulating um, their bodily based visceral responses in the name of being good and godly. Mm -hmm. And that's a very strong thread that runs through the middle of this country. And then you're right, we're a hardcore capitalist society. So it's all about go do more. And I had this experience years ago, I was actually in Hawaii. And at the time I was working in Century City. And I realized in, in Hawaii, I felt so much more sensual and alive, even though I look like hell, I didn't have any makeup on, I had on some, mm -hmm. you know, straggly t shirt and skirt, a yeah. barefoot. Um, and in Century City, I had on heels and suits and, you know, so I was sexualized in Century City, but not feeling very sexy. Mm. And in Hawaii, feeling incredibly loose and free in the body and feeling very sensual and alive. And I think that is that harness that we live in is yeah. part of what you're talking about. Right. And probably in Hawaii, I'm going to guess just more connected really to the sensuality of nature and, sure. and yeah. the earth and the outdoors. And given we have this sort of nature deprivation syndrome, I heard somebody say the largest mass migration we're experiencing is to the indoors. And, um, oh my God, that's so frightening. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, right. well, so, that actually aligns with another question I had for you, which is about how couples appear more to be more isolated now than ever, especially with the advent of COVID and everybody being indoors and frightened. Um, and statistically, people in the U.S. are having less sex than ever. So I, I wondered if you could speak to that a little bit. Well, I think of how the the pandemic has really confronted people with things that they they don't have the same ways to escape or, or numb or and then you know are also turning to some things too much to numb and escape but i think that being confronted with your relationship your relationship status as well as the quality of your relationship and uh, the ways in which that people really discovered like do i actually really like spending <laughs> some time with you i i think that space in a relationship can be um, sometimes underrated. I know there's different mm -hmm. views around that. Yeah. Um, but, and I know you've talked about this idea too before and some of, of the trainings I've, I've taken from you or what I've heard you say and some of your programming, just this idea of interdependence yeah. and, and the importance of that. And I think that it was hard for people to perhaps maintain that it, and continues to be. Yeah, uh, I think that's the great challenge that we have right now is how do we live with each other and without each other simultaneously? Um, which is really more the idea of uh, differentiation where we're both standing on our own two feet and we need each other for a myriad of things, but we also need our space. Um, we need time to develop and grow. That's part of what keeps us attractive to each other too. Mm -hmm. Right. So yeah, it seems like we're more insular. We're not really talking about what our sexual issues are. Um, and I think um, you know, there are public forums for healing, like 12 step programs, where people bring their pain, and they talk about it publicly, and they heal because of it. Mm -hmm. But couples don't seem to have a similar forum, um, unless they find a couples group somewhere to really start to talk about their sex life and their challenges, especially mm -hmm. the longer they're together. Most right, of, you know, yeah. fifty 50% of us just throw in the towel and say, okay, I wore that one out. I'm just going to get a new one. 
Right. Yes. I mean, and it makes me think of how I've always really wanted to do, I do retreats in the winter and I've always wanted to do ones for couples. And, and <laughs> this is actually pointing out just how important that would be yeah. uh, once we can feel more safe to travel. Um, but yeah, to have this place where we can all talk about the challenges that arise. So people aren't feeling alone, alone in their relationship. A lot of people can feel far more alone in a relationship than when they're unpartnered in a romantic yeah. sense of the word. I grew up in a small town where everybody knew everybody's business, which is why I left because I hated that. But I'm starting to see some of the wisdom in that. Like, you know, when someone down the street, your friend's parents are fighting and then, you know, when they've made up, right. It's not yeah. like, you know, the Jones is divorced and you're like, what, how did that happen? Which right. Is- and then maybe I can check in and support one another yes. and not yeah. pretend or have some facade that yeah, everything is, is just so peachy. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, So what are some of the sexual misconceptions? I know you delineate some of those in the pleasure is all yours. Um, So tell us how you think about that. Well, I talk about how I, I I think that people, well, in kind of a sex, the American way, I think that's needs to be really performative, mechanical, really uh, outcome based. And I think that that leaves us all in our heads and that's certainly not very pleasurable at all. Um, so that, that is similar to how we seem to do all things in the U S yeah, right. Um, and that's where I, I like to help encourage people to cultivate some of these, uh, healthy pleasures and other aspects of their life so that they can, uh, essentially it's almost like a foreplay so that if you're able to sort of be more playful in these other ways in your life, that can, you'll be more likely to bring that into the bedroom. That being said, there is this whole piece of vulnerability when we're with somebody else in that space. Um, but those are those are some of, I guess, misconceptions and certainly some of the things that we are we're socialized as that's how sex is supposed to be. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think we think of sex as penetrative sex. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think what you're touching on is more of, you know, some of the tantric ways, which is recognizing that pleasure is in everything. Um, I mean, there are paths that are paths of renunciation, and then there are paths of pleasure, where, you know, a cup of tea is a pleasurable, sensual, full body experience. It's not just about genital contact. Right, Um, right. Caressing your partner, like you say, play, laughter, all of that is very um, invigorating and creates vitality states in the body. Right, yeah. A life force energy. Mm -hmm. So you're saying then that one of the misconceptions is that sex is just about genital to genital contact and kind of getting off and it's mechanistic and no wonder people get bored of doing it. Well, and yeah, and and one of the misconceptions is is that also pleasure is all and only about sex. And Mm -hmm. so adding to what you were saying, really thinking about how can we change, you know, reframe this idea of pleasure as regenerative and a life force energy and and a creativity and that it can be found in these different areas of our life. And that if, if we are able to self-regulate, we aren't turning to pleasures as an escape in an aggressive way, but really choosing and it's, it's part of you know, what we can receive and bring in um, and ideally to share with somebody else. Um, and, and then I, I talk in the book just about the idea of what if it was more about understanding sex as this exchange of energy and sharing of, of, on the energetic level. Um, and an experiential process that is unfolding almost in a way it's like beginner's mind (laughs) where Mm -hmm. rather than these ideas it needs to look and act a certain way and um, because then we'll be disappointed when you know we our elbow hits somebody's face or (laughs) somebody what's the bed or who knows some of these things that are really so naturally human um, and part of part of our, our our intimacy as well really yeah well, I, you just said a lot there, and um, <laughs> I w- think I went off on a tangent in my head about this Puritanism again, and how we got so divorced from the joys of pleasure, mm. and how I know in my own childhood, my father was a survivor of you know Nazi occupation of his country. He wasn't in a camp per se, but you know expressing any kind of joy or excitement about something was often read as irresponsibility. 
like, don't get too excited about something because then you're going to be irresponsible, God forbid. Um, so there was a dourness about yeah. him where that was concerned. And, um, you know, but he was really available for pleasure when it came to food and um, things that Greek people love, you know, dance, things of that nature. So there were mixed messages there for me. And I'm sure everybody has their own version of that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the ways that pleasure gets stripped out of our childhoods and out of our lives um, and that we don't embrace things like afternoon naps because um, that oh, would be lazy, right. right? In a capitalist society, that's lazy. Right. I mean, I, I absolutely things like rest as pleasure and mm -hmm. and the fact that it's so radical that it, or it's so bold to uh, to do that, to to say no to things, to work, to, to take a sabbatical or any of these things. It's really become so radical, even though yeah. it is it's it's pleasure as well as survival. And uh, it, it allows us to show up in our relationships you know, with greater intimacy. But, but I, I think what you said about your father, it's so true. A lot of us have these mixed messages. And mm -hmm. as children, I think of how they are so intuitive and sing and dance and, and really are sensual. eating bodies, sensual. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So tell us about bodyfulness, because you started to, and I just wanted to kind of set the stage for um, kind of the way that you sort of launch us in your book. But what is bodyfulness? And can you explain the stages of it? Yes, I'd love to. Uh, bodyfulness, and I should say that I was using the word before knowing others who used it, and I'm excited to see all the different ways in which that word is used more and more. Um, and primarily, Christine Caldwell has a book called Bodyfulness. Oh. And, and we overlap in a lot of ways and then are different in different ways. But for me, bodyfulness is really about knowing your body, listening to your body, learning from it, uh, expressing your body, um, expressing it with others, allowing yourself to feel good in your body uh, and to feel good in your body with others. So, so it's also, there's this real embodiment piece and then a real reclamation, pleasure reclamation piece to how I see bodyfulness. Yeah, and so many people who have been traumatized are dissociated from their bodies. They don't even know they have impulse in their bodies, um, especially if somebody is depressed or extremely anxious getting them to track into the body and feel what the body is saying can be revolutionary for people. Mm -hmm. And scary. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, very scary, especially when there is trauma. Absolutely. It, yeah, it, I, I talk, oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was just gonna say that because part of why I also wanted to write the book back to your very first question, I guess, is because I've really learned so much from different somatic practitioners and I, there's so much that needs to be done for people with complex trauma and chronic trauma to really establish safety. And it's, it's um, I bow down to people really doing that work. And what I notice is there's really this hope to get people to a place to feel pleasure and joy and ease again in their life. And yet it's sort of, the work can sometimes fall off there, not with people more along the lines of you and I doing work both somatically and with sexual health and pleasure. But for a lot of people, it's about establishing safety. And then they, it, it doesn't really go to that next part about, well, how, how can you allow yourself to feel good and pleasure again? Mm -hmm. uh, so that's where for me, bodyfulness, I really wanted to pick up on, on that element. And so the book is not meant for people who, who have really complex trauma that might may not have done any embodiment work or somatic work yet. So I give a list of resources yeah. for those individuals. So then is this what you mean when you say our issues are in our tissues? Yeah, exactly. Yes. Uh, who doesn't love all these rhymes? I have a lot of them in the book, yeah. but, and I don't actually know who first said it, but um, I know that's well, a common one. Yeah, I will. I mean, it rhymes so beautifully. And I think all the somatic practitioners and body workers talk about the fascia, the connective mm -hmm. tissue in our muscles um, and bones and how when they palpate those or work on that those particular areas, people start to have feelings just laying on a massage table because our emotions live in our body and they can get yeah. trapped in our body. Mm -hmm. um, and oftentimes sex can feel very threatening because if there was a historical trauma, the person starts to have the experience of that in real time. Yeah. And that is necessary to work through in order to get to pleasure. 
Because pleasure, ultimately, sexual pleasure is about hitting our full potential. Mm, mm-hmm. so, That's beautiful. Yeah. So for anybody listening, if you have had sexual trauma, it's important and it's great that you're listening to this and you should read this book, but you shouldn't put the cart before the horse so you're not hurting mm-hmm. yourself. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's a part of why I wanted to really start the book with, I do talk about different types of pleasure in the beginning, but then I really go into, well, first, what, what are these barriers to us being in our body and letting ourselves be, uh, you know, seeing pleasure as sacred mm-hmm. um, and then going into bodyfulness before I really dive more into erotic and sexual pleasure, because I, I've worked with a lot of people who they want the mind blowing orgasm, but then with, with further questioning, they don't know their body. They don't like their body. They, mm-hmm. they, um, you know, don't want to be there. And so I really wanted to start from the bottom up and really the, the body up with, with, you know, more of a hierarchical way of helping people to reclaim it. I love that Rachel, because I really think that's women perpetrating violence on themselves, like forcing some, an orgasm, um, <clears throat> whether manually or with a vibrator, because they just have to have an orgasm, as opposed to getting curious about what is what actually is an orgasm. Maybe you can tell us that. And how do you define pleasure? I know those are two different questions. Yeah. Um, because you do define pleasure. You break it down um, in the book. Yes. Well, and 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 along the lines of of an orgasm, it's you know, we can break it down to the most least romantic way would be a muscle spasm (laughs) that that has been really quite glorified. And Uh and while it certainly can, you know, I also talk in the book about some of the benefits of masturbation and that can, or does not have to do with orgasm, but there, yeah, there's certainly some health benefits to it, but when that is the obsession, then of course there's going to be um, shame that there's something wrong with me if we're not having them. Um, And of course, over our lifespan, and, you know, and, and different things going on in our life, it's going to change, you know, what, how we respond to touch and intimacy. Um, but it is, it, it makes me sad the ways that people miss the sensuality and the playfulness and the connection and mm-hmm. the bonding that can come with things uh, aside from, from orgasm. Um, right. So yeah. you talk about pleasure as sensual, playful, um, livelihood pleasure and sexual pleasure. What do you mean by livelihood pleasure? And, you know, it's interesting that livelihood, I, a lot of, a lot of this work first started from a a TEDx talk I did in which I was really talking about livelihood in ways that had to do more with liveliness, but in the book, I really want people to think of, of that type of pleasure as flow states that can happen in your livelihood, such as your job, your career, but also outside of that, whether it be in the hobbies or interests or um, adventure that you see, hmm. but these, this idea of more flow states uh, where you really time might stand still and you're so immersed, you're mm-hmm. really integrated uh, and that type of pleasure which once in a while I had writing the book. (laughs) Right, that's right. Well, yes, there are moments of reading, rereading something, saying, oh my God, this is so good. Like who wrote this? (laughs) Yeah, yeah, just, oh, I like that paragraph. Right. Um, Yeah, but you know, there's so much noise and so many distractions sometimes to being in that flow state. Or we don't, one of the things I mentioned in the book is sometimes we don't know how to get there because we don't know what we want. I mean, the question of what do I want can be um, so foreign, especially if we aren't connected to, you know, our inner knowing and our body. Um, But that certainly informs the types of things in our life that are going to be more or less pleasurable. How would you suggest people spend time with that question? What do I want? (sighs) Yeah, I just took an exhale as you as you asked. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thinking of how to drop in and the challenges to sort of dropping in. But I think it starts with this deserving self, you know, to, to feel that I deserve to want, I deserve to receive mm-hmm. and, um, and, and kind of who and how is this deserving self? Um, you know, can I give myself permission to do so? And especially I think for people socialized as a female, that can be hard to do to receive. So I think some of the work has to do with helping people realize just in their innate humanness, they are deserving to to want whether we receive all things we want or not um, but but that that's part of life balance as well hi this is alex if you like what you're listening to i encourage you to check out my book mirror of intimacy available on amazon along with my other books also be sure to visit www 
www.centerforhealthysex.com to learn more about the services we offer and subscribe to our daily Mirror of Intimacy meditation emails. Yeah, so certainly if somebody's been traumatized, if they've been abused emotionally, physically, neglected, sexually abused, they're going to have a hard time with this sense of entitlement, of deserving. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that requires a deeper exploration um, coming out of deprivation, because oftentimes uh, women and men can use sex as a way to shame themselves and brutalize themselves. Um, and that's the opposite of the kind of pleasure I think we're talking about here. Yeah, yeah. So it's like they're imprisoned all the more in a way with these expectations. Yeah. Uh, tell us about the four love myths. I mean, love heals all is a, a hardcore myth in our culture, I think. It's sort of the captivated by the white dress for heterosexual females, maybe right. gay females also, that the white dress is the holy grail. Right. And then that this enters you into this place where it's like you have a savior. Um, and, mm-hmm. um, and, and yes, I love, I love the idea of love as, as inspiring. And I just, and that we are relational creatures. And of course that, that we can be inspired and we can have, you know, a sense of safety and grounding from those around us, but that this idea that then we don't have to do our own work or look inward or to really be honest with ourselves um, is that is that I think an illusion that doesn't do us any favors. Um, And then that's, that's putting a lot of, quite a lot of pressure on this other person, quite a lot of expectations on the relationship. Um, But so it's, yeah, I think that certainly looking at the ways in which also, you know, love can be very narcissistic and how we just wanted to really maybe reflect who we are, reflect who we are, or be the ideal, you know, live to the, up to this ideal version of you. Um, and that can create some, some problems as well. Yeah. Um, I, I often think that, you know, our best course of action is to act as if we're already in love with our own selves. Mm -hmm. And so that when a lover or a partner comes along, it's additive, it's not the main event. Mm -hmm. It's like like you said, that poor person, and you know, (laughs) it's like they become a hostage or something, they don't really become an equal partner. So I think it's useful to ask ourselves, what am I bringing to the party? Mm -hmm. What am I bringing to a relationship? Not what can I get out of somebody else? Right. And, and really choosing to be in a relationship because it is something that you, you want to can enhance your life versus something that you sort of grasp for or desperately need, or it's, it's filling a void just as also sex can be filling a void of course, too. Um, so, and I have a lot of my clients, that's, that's a big thing of what I work with with people of just sort of how to be reveling in their singleness in a way mm-hmm. that, that uh, enhances and helps them appreciate the relationship with self. Right. You know, David Snarch, who you well know, was a famous um, sexual marital therapist, and he used to talk about um, choosing and being chosen Mm -hmm. and how important both of those things are. And so many people get into relationships without actually choosing the other person or they're not being chosen by the other. So it's unilateral. It's not a two person situation. And I think that's an extremely important aspect. He also talked about wanting and wanting to want. Yeah. Um, So those, um, you could spend a long time on pondering those two notions um, as opposed to just giving ourselves over or taking scraps or operating out of desperation. And that reminds me of that idea of just how how wanting to be wanted and, and to be wanted is also can be a real... Uh, igniting kind of our own desire as well. Yeah, lovely. So does this tie into the second myth that there's one and there's one and only soulmate, which I think, when was that? Like the 80s, the soulmate decade? (laughs) (laughs) I know There are a lot of books about soulmates, I think at that time. Right. And I feel like as soon as you you add the word soul, it sort of can be, ooh, this is all the more sort of juicy or magical once we bring something that's connected to to the soul or it's it's all the more deeper. Um, But it's, I think, again, that's also, yeah, putting, wow, a lot of pressure on people 
And um, I think there's so many sources of love and so many ways to you know, have intimacy. And uh, we, it's so limiting to think that there's only one. And it makes people feel a lot of shame when it doesn't work out or, mm. or the ways in which I mentioned in the book too, there, can, there was a, a person who had a really, um, it was a very healthy, mature 10 year, decade long relationship that ended. And that person just felt like a complete failure. Um, mm. And I guess that also kind of ties more to the, the later myth about just how it needs to be kind of long-term forever. Um, but, but yeah, I think with this soulmate idea, it prevents us from seeing the, the intimacy and pleasures that can come from these other people that we meet that, um, you know, in, in different ways in our life and beyond even just romantic or sexual. Yeah, I think that's nice because <clears throat> it seems like we can swing from these polarities from, you know, excessive and compulsive and really pornographic sexual behavior mm -hmm. that can feel devoid of the self and the way you're talking about it or this idea of happily ever after till death do us part. And I like what you're saying that we meet many people along the way that we experience sexual pleasure with um, or pleasurable experiences. And there's not one one person that's going to complete us or bring us happiness or sexual pleasure uh, that we meet many, many people along the way uh, that bring us those different experiences. Yeah, and really being open to the different energies of uh, that, that of, of people rather than this set list of, okay, this is the list of everything I want. And then if you don't right. meet this, <laughs> you know, or you were chewing too, uh, you know, slowly and not eating fast enough or there's food in your teeth, but that, there's these ways in which um, people have can get really so hyper-focused on like what they want to manifest yeah. as opposed to maybe what is it that you want to feel energetically. And, um, and, and then, then again, that's about your body too, and more subtle mm -hmm. body energy as well. Um, but, but not looking at what, what you want on paper only. And that yeah, list. because that is <laughs> who are you on paper is my question. <laughs> yeah, really. Like good, bad, and ugly. Mm -hmm. um, so, and then the one you talked about is about being selfless, not focusing on yourself. What do you mean by that? Yeah, that this idea of real, true love then is about being all about for that other person and, and giving. And, mm. and of course, we need um, altruism and we need to be caring. We need to have con collective care and care in our relationship, of course. But um, if we don't really know and state what we want to need and have boundaries around that and even give the gift of sharing that with others, especially with our limits and boundaries, then I, I don't think that does any relationship any favors. Right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So that's about not over giving to others to the exclusion of yourself, what we might call codependency, yeah. uh, where, where people lose themselves in the relationships, um, that there is a healthy compassion, as you said, and caring and tending to the other, but not at our own expense. So where we're hurting ourselves. Mm -hmm. Really? Yeah. Let it, let it bubble up from within you, what your desires are, not really just sort of what the other person tells you they want. Yeah. So we were talking about orgasm before, and I have this question about why um, or what, why you think women struggle so much with this orgasm issue and, and how our culture perpetrates that. Well, I, yeah, I think that with, you know, the influence of porn and the ways in which it's really not about women's pleasure at all. It's really all about the male gaze and, um, and that's, that's where I think some of my work as a yoga teacher and with Ayurvedic medicine, just really loving the ways it encourages women to also give their self, themselves breast massage or to have you know, these ways of really being sensual in their own body and just feel the pleasure within themselves. Um, but, but yeah, to your question, I think that is, it's part of the patriarchy again of, yeah. of really, if, if women are told that they're supposed to, if it's really not about their own pleasure and it's really about serving men, then why would women know what feels good in their body and um, give themselves permission to feel good in, in different ways, whether it be an orgasm or not, or the different ways that they, they could explore their body to have different orgasms? Yeah, I think, you know, really, I examined at one point what happened with this girl 
Girls Gone Wild movement in the 90s mm. and how women started having sex like men to prove that they could throw down, they could do it too, but mm. really hurting themselves in pretty profound ways, I think. And so this reclamation of female pleasure um, has gotten skewed along the way. Certainly our sisters in the 60s um, were saying, yeah, we have a right to our own bodies and our own pleasure. Uh, but then as always, um, either you can call it the patriarchy, partially capitalism co-ops what's out there and turns it into the mainstream. And so yeah. this is how women got more objectified, more sexualized in some ways. So, right. Same with the whole like influencer culture too, of, yeah. um, for a lot of, of women and young girls that feel like they are sort of in charge of my body uh, as far as how they express it. And maybe not really realizing the ways in which this is further objectification and exploitation. Yeah. Especially when they start removing ribs, you know, to have thinner waists and oh, yeah. you know, uh, damaging their labia by trimming them because that's not what they look like in porn. Um, these all become subjugations. I think of the feminine of the feminine as the divine, not as some, sub, you know, subjugated little stay at home mom, unless not that there's anything wrong with that if it's a choice, but um, this submissive idea of what that means, uh, mm -hmm. that you can own your sexuality and your sexual pleasure without having to objectify yourself or hurt yourself in those ways. So one of the things I loved in The Pleasure is All Yours is how you talk about different types of orgasms and how different bodies orgasm differently. I think that might be the first time I ever considered that or thought about it in the way that you put it. And I was like, oh, right. When I read that, of course, mm -hmm. um, why would it be the same? Right. Well, and I know one of the main things that I, I know I had talked about, whether it be with friends or clients, was just people feeling a lot of women feeling shame because maybe they didn't um, have an orgasm a certain type of way or they didn't even know where their G spot was or um, feeling, well, I can only have clitoral or I can only have vaginal or there's these ways in which you know, feeling shame for not having um, all different kinds in all different ways all the time. Right. Um, but, but yeah, I know some of the research I looked into had to do with just really you know, anatomically speaking, uh, mm -hmm. when you look at the distance, um, from your, your clitoris to your vulva and how that even just a small, small, uh, distance, um, difference can be the difference between somebody being able to have, or to feel a vaginal orgasm versus somebody else. Um, of course, there's so many other aspects that are involved as far as just, yeah, are you in your body and do you feel safe? Yeah, sure. Your, um, right. I mean, we can thank Freud for that because you may recall that he privileged vaginal orgasms, saying that vaginal orgasms were more of a mature woman's way of orgasming and clitoral stimulation was more hysterical um, or childlike, which oh, I, mean, just, I had not heard that. Now I have oh, another. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and so what's hysterical about that actually is that the clitoris sole function is pleasure. So mm -hmm. why would you be hysterical if you were touching it? You'd be hysterical if you weren't touching it. <laughs> um, right. It's like that the fear of the sort of erotic energy and power that women have uh, yeah. when, when they are in their pleasure and owning it. Right. And that we can so freely orgasm in multiple, multiple ways. Just body shivers could be considered an orgasm. Like you said, there are muscle spasms in the autonomic nervous system. It's excitation. Um, so if somebody is rubbing your feet when you're having a pedicure and you're having a foot gasm, that's real. <laughs> it feels really, really pleasurable because there's so many nerve endings there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, I had a professor in college who said that she she shared this with our anthropology class. Um, you know, it was a, one of those smaller liberal arts colleges mm -hmm. where you really got to know the professor. But at the gym, there's a there's basically this place where you it's an abdominal uh, machine where you you kind of sit up on it and then you lift your legs and you really engage the core to lift your legs. And there was something about doing that exercise <laughs> that she found was really stimulating. And so she would sometimes have to stop after a certain number. Probably because look, she was activating the pelvic floor muscles. Mm -hmm. And so that's almost like a Kegel type exercise with that sort of activation. So she mm -hmm. was getting um, anatomically and autonomically aroused and mm -hmm. that can feel orgasmic. So yeah. it, it's yeah. important to realize and women have already used this language, you know, just sometimes taking a bite of something densely chocolate 
And then we have this experience of like, oh my God, that's orgasmic. We even <laughs> say that because it's activating dopamine in the brain, um, the sugar, of course, there are all sorts of sensations mm -hmm. going through the body from that. Yeah. Yeah. And with the, with the dairy, there's sort of a little serotonin in there mm -hmm. too. It's sort of the perfect medley. Yeah. So widening our lens of what is pleasure, what brings us pleasure without mm -hmm. collapsing into, you know, forcing orgasm in order to please someone else or look a certain way is really, I think the conversation that we're in right now that I'm so happy about, because I don't think we can have enough of these conversations. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I really wanted my book to appeal to sort of just the average person that, you know, might not know a lot about somatic psychology or know, mm -hmm. you know, really a lot about um, maybe sexual health and, and just break down some misconceptions and, um, and just more everyday language. And also to not have it just be a Western medical uh, viewpoint to like, why not bring in some of these really wise, you know, Eastern mm -hmm. contemplative practices to, to add to how we can relate to our bodies and our pleasure as well. Well, I was wondering what your um, relationship was to Ayurvedic medicine, and maybe you can explain to our listeners what that is. And uh, because you have quite a beautiful um, appendix in the book that has all sorts of resources for people and um, practices as well. So can you talk about the Ayurvedic aspect and the practices? Right. I, yeah, I have a chapter that really looks at Ayurvedic me medicine. I also talk a bit about the chakra system, but with Ayurvedic medicine, it's understood to be the sister science to yoga. And, but it's really a lifestyle about a lifestyle practices and rituals. And, um, and it's very preventative. It's really about what are these things that we can do day to day to really be um, nourishing ourselves and our body. And it is particular to our sort of uh, disposition or temperament, recognizing that we all have within us these different earth elements, but we express them differently or depending on the seasons or what's going on in our life, they can um, get out of balance. And so they offer different rituals and different um, things to eat and um, suggestions for, for sleep, um, for um, supplements, um, for activity versus rest to really help you to be, you know, uh, to, to be in balance. And, um, and then also they, one of the areas of Ayurvedic medicine that really hasn't been talked about that I started to delve into is how your disposition, they call them doshas, your particular temperament or disposition type, how your dosha impacts who you choose as a partner and your, and your sexual chemistry. And, and um, there's really very little on that. Some, I need an Ayurvedic scholar out there to hopefully uh, uh, write a book about that. Um, because I do think it's, it can impact when you look at somebody say who's more fire type primarily versus air versus earth. Those are the three main doshas. Um, you're going to have different needs for time of day of when you might be in the mood and the mm -hmm. season and types um, of food. I, right. Yeah. And how that impacts you. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I found really fascinating about Ayurvedic medicine is speaking of types of food, just how they focus so much on digestion and assimilation of, of food. And it really, they knew the enteric brain before right. <laughs> you understood the power of the enteric brain before that was a word, even at all in their vocabulary, like we talk about it now. Yeah. One of the things I love about that system is eating dessert first, eating sweet first. <laughs> <laughs> talk about pleasurable. But there was something you just said that I think is really, it goes back to our uh, an earlier conversation about separateness and togetherness, that we meet somebody, we fall in love with them, we have great sex with them, and then we think we should fall into patterns of sameness. Like when you and I wake up in the morning, you and I should want the exact same food at the exact same time. Likewise, we have to meet at dinner at the same time, whether we're hungry or not, and then eat whatever the person is cooking whether or not that is compatible yeah. to digestion or diet, for example, as opposed to something radically non-traditional, which is let's eat when we're hungry, let's eat what's right for us right now. Yeah. Um, we could bring our food to each other, <laughs> and but maybe <laughs> you know somebody's eating at five o'clock because they're really really hungry, and someone else is eating at seven because they have a meeting. Um, and right. And, and so that's part of the attraction. The difference is even part of like what leads to attraction, but right. I, yeah. That's such a good point of like, we're, 
we're not, well, why are we trying to merge in these ways that are not healthy for our oh, youth? I, I realized this in the spring, my nephew was visiting and I was making dinner for him and my husband. And I adopted more of a ketogenic diet during the pandemic. And I realized that I was colonizing them to my way of eating. Like I didn't know if they wanted to eat this way, but they were eating this way now. And it struck me like, huh, that, that, that's not really what either one of them might be wanting to eat, but yeah. um, so- Hey, somebody was cooking food for them and- uh, They didn't care, thought, right, exactly. Not to assume it was you, but that- It hey. was me. And okay. so, but I think these are patterns that we want to um, challenge ourselves on with our partners and how do we breathe more space into our relationships? Um, so we're not trying to get the other person to do something that they don't want to do or that it's not suited for them. Um, in terms of their health and well-being, right? Yeah, I, I, and I and I think that there's within each dosha there it, there's room to really experiment and be curious mm -hmm. with what works for you. I mean, I think with with a lot of what I talk about in there is that yeah, there isn't any one formula, but no, yeah. what is how, what is your body telling you as far as how you know how do you notice these differences in the seasons and what you're eating and some of these. And a lot of the rituals are really self-care, self-love rituals too. So, and yeah. really to your body, whether it be with oils on your mm -hmm. skin, um, you know, essential oils and um, in these ways of being in your senses and really beautifully. And I think also um, you said this, but our doshas change over time. You mm -hmm. know, when I was in my twenties, my dosha was very different than it is today um, because I was faster, quicker, thinner, whatever, <laughs> um, than I am now. So bodies change and bodies have moods, just like they have sexual moods. And we're not just these fixed robots that should just be doing the same thing day in, day out, week in, year out, et cetera. Yeah. Which so, is part of the beauty of being human. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we can let ourselves lean into some of that mystery and transformation, as opposed to seeing it as just unfamiliar and scary. So as we start to wrap this up, I want to ask you um, what pleasure potential is and how it's developed. Well, I think that it's it really starts from within. Of course, there's such potential in the ways in which when we are in our bodies and receiving pleasure in groups, what I noticed the research shows is how um, pleasure, that, that is the pleasure potential that can really expand for collective well-being and I think help mm -hmm. with our collective trauma and that the research shows that when we, you know, whether it be a spin class or a music concert, when we're really embodied in these ways together in community, that sense of separateness also can dissolve and there's more yeah, uh, compassion for others and altruism. And so I think that that's a big part of the pleasure potential that we, we need now more than ever. Oh, that's, that's beautiful, especially as we're coming out of this isolation, hopefully more and more. Um, and more and more people are talking about collective trauma and collective healing in groups in these ways. Um, so I love that idea that when we get together in groups, sing, dance, spin, whatever, mm -hmm. uh, that there is a collective energy and healing that takes place there, just like group meditations. Right. Yeah. And, and it doesn't even need to be about talking to these other individuals yeah. or, um, but in that energy and share just the shared experience, similar to how I know a lot of couple therapists talk about um, suggesting couples do novel experiences together as well. That I think it's a, that similar idea too, of, yeah. of really to share, to share in the space together in a new and different ways. Beautiful. So is there anything else you want us to know about the pleasure is all yours? Uh well, I think that it's, it's, I, I have it in three parts and, and it can take a while to get to what a lot of people think the book is about, which is just sort of sex. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think that um, for me, it was just so important to help people in that first section understand these barriers, because I see so many people blame themselves um, for, for why they aren't loving their body more or, or having more pleasure or having relationships they think they should have. And so I think for me, just um, understanding that systemic piece um, and just these oppressive systems that, you know, are big, a big part of it. And it doesn't mean it's our fault, um, but it also doesn't mean we have to be stuck in that. You know, how can we right. each really be our own inner, tap into our inner rebel and reclaim some of these things about being in our body and expressing it um, and, and that that is really a gift to each other. The more that we 
combat our repression with expression. Um, mm. It's to really then be in relationship that way to me is pleasurable. That's beautiful. Thank you. So tell us where we can find you, where our listeners can find you. Obviously, uh, your book, The Pleasure is All Yours, Reclaim Your Body's Bliss and Reignite Your Passion for Life can be found on Amazon.com. Yes. Yeah. I'm, my website's Dr. Rachel Allen, Allen with a Y. And I, um, um, I have an Instagram as well that I've been doing some different things on, which is Dr. Rachel Allen as well. So D-R-R-A, a couple R's in a row there. And, but on my website, you'll see, I do some retreats and um, different now and then different workshops. Uh, haven't been attempting a, a book tour in a pandemic. It's been interesting. So yeah, things like this have been helpful. Good. Um, but yeah, that's the best place to find me. One-stop shop at Dr. Rachel Allen. Great. All right. Thank you so much, Rachel. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Yeah. Thank you. It's been my pleasure as well. If you like this episode, be sure to like it, subscribe, and leave a rating or a comment. You can find our other episodes on Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Spotify, and alexkatahakis.com. Follow me at Alex Katahakis on Twitter and Instagram. Thank you for listening to the Alex Katahakis podcast. Remember that loving deeply begins with loving yourself.